Hi there, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. This video is going to continue talking about Susan Wolf's theory about meaningful lives, but we're going to focus on some challenges in this video instead. So we'll focus on reviewing what her proposed account is, and then we'll ask, is the objective value that she appeals to actually necessary? Then we'll see, well, what about that subjective value? Is that necessary to have meaning in one's life? Then lastly, we'll look at is having both the objective value and the subjective value that's included in her account, is that enough to give us meaning in our lives? Is that sufficient? So Wolf proposes the following account of what it is to live a meaningful life. A life is meaningful if and only if it involves active engagement with projects of worth. So there's two parts to that. There's the active engagement, where this involves a kind of subjective value that depends on your own attitude or feelings about what you're doing in your life. Now, this isn't just a kind of enjoyment, according to Susan Wolf. It's a feeling of being passionate about, about loving what you're doing. And you can sometimes feel actively engaged with an activity, even though sometimes you are frustrated by it. You're not enjoying it. You might even power through that frustration because even at that moment, you still feel the passion for this project, for this thing that you're doing. Now, on the other side, though, this passion has to be directed at a project of worth. What she means by that is it has to be a project or activity or thing that has its own value independent of your own attitudes or feelings. It has objective value. So according to Wolf's account, this active engagement, these subjective feelings are necessary to have a meaningful life, but those feelings by themselves aren't enough because you might, someone might feel that passion for things that are trivial, that are not actually worthwhile, in which case she thinks that it doesn't add meaning to your life. On the other hand, the involvement with projects of worth is also necessary but it's still not sufficient for having meaning by itself because someone might be doing something that's worthwhile, like writing checks to charity or even being a housewife or being a doctor, but it's possible that their heart is not in it, that they're just going through the motions. Now, being a doctor, being a mother might still be incredibly worthwhile, objectively valuable, but if their heart's not in it, the idea is it's not really going to give meaning in their own life. So Susan Wolf thinks you need to combine these things together. It's only when you have both active engagement, you feel that passion, your heart is in what you're doing, and the thing you're doing is a project of worth. So it's when you put those together that you have something sufficient for adding meaning to your life. It's when you love what you do and the thing that you're doing is deserving of that love. It's where subjective attractiveness meets objective attraction, as she says sometimes. One kind of question we might ask, though, is Susan Wolf thinks that both the subjective component and the objective component are necessary. Someone might suggest, hey, look, I'm on board with this subjective feeling, this passion you have to feel in order to get meaning in your life. I don't really care where you get it. So someone might suggest what really matters here is, yeah, it's not just enjoyment or pleasure we're looking for, but it is still a feeling. It's a particular kind of pleasant feeling. On this view, someone might say, our longing for meaning, our desire for meaning in our lives is nothing more than a desire for a very specific kind of pleasure. It's not just more pleasure, it's a certain quality of pleasure that we're looking for that we might call a feeling of fulfillment. And someone might suggest that that feeling that you sometimes get is sufficient for adding meaning to your life. So consider an analogy here just to make clear what's being proposed. Some foods taste good, but they lack substance to fill you up. Other foods taste good, but also have enough substance to fill you up. So if I snack on M&Ms all day, I might enjoy the taste. I might get pleasure out of it, but I don't get this feeling of being filled. And But if I eat a meal of chicken and potatoes and gravy, I get not only pleasure from that, but I also feel filled. I, I feel full. Similarly, some activities might give us pleasures that are nice, but those activities don't feel fulfilling to us. 
So this is how I feel about playing board games. Playing board games is nice. I enjoy it. But I don't feel fulfilled with my life when I play board games. Other pleasures, they're not just nice, but they actually feel fulfilling. Spending time with my family, helping raise my kids. Sometimes that's frustrating, but I also feel fulfilled by it. And that feeling of fulfillment is itself a certain kind of pleasure. So the idea here is that the desire for meaning is not just a desire for a pleasurable life. And it's not just a desire for having more pleasure in your life. Rather, it's a desire for a particular kind of pleasure. We'd be willing to give up certain kinds of pleasure to experience this higher quality pleasure of fulfillment. In the same way, I might be willing to pay more money for less food because it's more feeling. It's a higher quality of food. I might be willing to give up less quality pleasures like board games in order to spend more time with my family and get the more fulfilling pleasure. So on this kind of subjective fulfillment account, it doesn't matter what kind of activities give you that feeling. It just the feeling itself that provides you with meaning. In other words, on this alternative, something can contribute meaning to our lives, even if what you're doing has no objective value, if its only value is the feeling that it provides. But wait, you might say, hold on. There were those examples. When we think about examples, some activities like moral and intellectual accomplishments, relationships with our friends and family, religious practices, these are the kind of things that come to mind as contributing meaning to our lives. Whereas other activities like doing crosswords, eating chocolate, riding a roller coaster, playing board games, we, we, we enjoy those, but they don't seem to be the kind of activities that can give us meaning. So, if someone says that all that matters is this subjective experience of feeling fulfilled, how can they explain why some activities come to mind as providing meaning, but other activities don't? Well, what the subjective fulfillment account will say is that well, it's not anything objective about the activities themselves that makes them meaningful. Rather, the reason activities like moral and intellectual accomplishments come to mind when we think about meaningful lives it's just because given the way human psychology works, some activities are more likely to produce those feelings of fulfillment than others. For most people, playing board games, playing video games doesn't provide them with this feeling of fulfillment in their life. Whereas moral and intellectual accomplishments or spending time with friends and family, developing those relationships, maybe going to religious activities, those kinds of activities tend to give people feelings of fulfillment and that's why they come to mind when we think of the of meaningful lives but that's just a fact about our psychology not a fact about the activities themselves so it's possible that there could be a person very different than most human beings that gets feelings of fulfillment from doing crosswords and this theory would say that's all that matters then that gives meaning to their life if they get that special kind of pleasure that we're after so this alternative picture also might be related to some worries about objective value and related worries about elitism. So objective value seems mysterious. It isn't clear what standard we could use to determine which projects are and are not objectively worthwhile. Like, What is it that makes those activities better than others? If it's just the subjective feeling that we're after, that seems not mysterious. Some activities give us this feeling, some activities don't doesn't matter what the activities are. We have a clear standard for what would create or what would give this kind of value when we appeal to these subjective factors. Now, many people also tend to think that objective theories of value feel elitist. It feels biased and arrogant to suggest that some activities are objectively more worthwhile than others. If someone feels passionate about what they do, isn't that good enough? Why should we judge them for that passion that they feel? You might say, who are we to judge that what they love to do is less deserving of that devotion than the things we devote our lives to? So it seems elitist claims that our projects are more worthwhile or better than the project that someone else likes and devotes their life to. It seems full of ourselves, biased, and just arrogant. Whereas if you say, no, there's nothing objectively better about how I spend my time and how you spend your time. It's just a matter of how we feel about it. 
But if you don't feel good about what you're doing, then you might say, well, then, it, yeah, it, it is lacking in value, but that's something that you can realize for yourself. It's not a judgment coming from someone else. So the subjective theory seems less elitist, less judgmental in this way. Wolf makes several points in response to this kind of objection that proposes this alternative, purely subjective account of meaning. She admits that a feeling of fulfillment is necessary for living a meaningful life. That's the whole purpose of her appeal to this feeling of active engagement. That's meant to be that you feel passionate, you feel fulfilled by the things you're doing. But she argues that that feeling, it can't be sufficient for having meaning in your life. Because firstly, she says, things feel fulfilling to us uh, partly because we believe they are objectively good. Like, why do you feel fulfilled when you help your family? Or, like, if you're a veterinarian and you're helping animals and you feel fulfilled with your career, why is it that you feel fulfilled by that career? She thinks the reason is because you believe that what you're doing is worthwhile, is an objectively good thing. That's part of why you feel fulfilled by it in the first place. And that suggests that the feeling itself presupposes that you desire that kind of interaction with something objectively valuable. Moreover, we could have experiences where we know something previously gave us feelings of fulfillment, but we might still question whether it actually gave us meaning. As an example, in a midlife crisis, someone might look back on and say, yeah, I felt fulfilled by my career, but now that I look back on it, it seems like my career didn't really matter. They worry that it didn't give their life meaning even though they felt fulfilled at the time. That suggests that what they are really worried about is not did they have this feeling. They are worried that the thing they were doing didn't deserve that feeling. It wasn't worth that kind of passion that they dedicated to it. And so their passion was wasted on something that wasn't good. And now here's another example she gives. Take that mythical figure of Sisyphus again, pushing the rock up the mountain, falls back down, up the mountain, falls back down. But now imagine that the gods brainwash Sisyphus by giving him a drug that makes him feel fulfilled, that makes this his passion, just pushing this rock up over and over again. Does it seem to make Sisyphus's life meaningful? Would you want to live Sisyphus's life? In that kind of case where Sisyphus feels fulfilled by pushing this rock up and down the up the mountain over and over and over again for eternity. Susan Wolf thinks that most people are going to say, no, this is still horrifying. Um, and it still, still seems meaningless because pushing that rock up the mountain is pointless. Like, it just doesn't matter. And so even if Sisyphus feels fulfilled by it, that's even scarier because he shouldn't feel fulfilled by this project because it's just pointless it's just worse because now he's just brainwashed and thinking something's valuable even though it's not so a lot of these objections seem to suggest that it's possible for someone ourselves or someone else to mistakenly believe that something adds meaning to their life so they believe that it adds meaning even though it doesn't that's what happens in the case of sisyphus who feels fulfilled sisyphus might think that his life is meaningful But when we look at it from the outside, we think to ourselves, well, no, because the project just is trivial and doesn't matter. Sisyphus is mistaken. He thinks his life is meaningful, but there really is no meaning to it. Or if someone is the victim of a religious cult, they might feel fulfilled when they're a part of this cult. But when they break free, they look back and they worry that everything that they did didn't mean anything. That suggests that they look back on their own life and they think, yeah, I used to believe that this added meaning to my life. I felt like it added meaning to my life. But now that they broke free of that religious cult, they think that they were wrong. But that kind of mistake doesn't seem like it would be possible on the subjective fulfillment account. Because on that view, if you felt fulfilled, if it felt like it gave you meaning, then it did give you meaning. You couldn't be wrong about that. The fact that we think we can make these kinds of mistakes suggests that we think of meaning as more objective than just a feeling we get. Now, we could also add as further evidence that this subjective feeling is not sufficient by appealing to the experience machine. Someone in the experience machine might be given experiences that feel very fulfilling to them. They believe that their life has meaning, 
but it looks like it doesn't. And that's one of the things that scares us about the experience machine. But you might wonder, well, if we have that objective component, if that's necessary, why do you need the subjective component? Someone might argue that you don't need active engagement as long as you have a project of worth. That's enough for a meaningful life. So in order to understand this kind of objection, the attempt to show that you don't need this subjective feeling in order to live a meaningful life, I want you to consider this question. Is it possible for someone to mistakenly believe their life is meaningless? So is it possible for someone to believe their life has no meaning, even though their life is meaningful? If subjective fulfillment was actually necessary to have a meaningful life, it isn't clear how someone could make this mistake. Because if they feel like their life is meaningless, then they're missing the subjective fulfillment that this view says is necessary. If this situation is possible where someone mistakenly thinks their life is meaningless, but it's not, it looks like this subjective value isn't actually necessary to have meaning. So the philosopher Aaron Smuts suggests the following example as an illustration of this possibility. It comes from Fank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, a movie from 1946, very popular Christmas movie. But this movie tells what is now a familiar story of a suicidal man, George Bailey, who's finally able to see the meaning of his life with a little help from a friend, an alcoholic angel who wants to make good. The angel takes George on a trip to Pottersville, this alternate world where George had never been born. And the idea is that the angel shows how much worse the town would be and the people in the town would be, thereby showing how much of a difference, how much good George has brought into this town and to the people here. And a few hours is enough for George to see how meaningful his existence has been. On his dark night of the soul, George mistakenly thought that his life was meaningless because the family business was likely to fail under his stewardship and the failure of the family bank would certainly be a significant loss. However, it would not sap his life of positive meaning. Just look at how much good George did for the people in his town. Although George couldn't see it, his life was indeed meaningful. The trip to Pottersville helps correct his incorrect assessment of the meaning of his life. So the idea here is that George Bailey wasn't getting these feelings of fulfillment from his life, wasn't getting these subjective good feelings from what he was doing, and thereby thought that his life was meaningless. Now, if those feelings were necessary for a meaningful life, then George would have been right. His life would have been meaningless. But the idea is that the angel doesn't create meaning in George's life. Rather, the angel just shows George the meaning that has always been there. But if George now sees that even though he wasn't getting these feelings of fulfillment, his life was meaningful because of all the good that it did for everybody else, it looks like his life was meaningful even though he didn't have those feelings of fulfillment. So this is not an objection that Susan Wolf considers in her article, but I wanted to bring it up because it's very interesting, and I want you to think about what you think about this kind of example. Is it true that this is a case where someone's life has meaning, but they don't have these subjective feelings that usually go with having a meaningful life? Now, another kind of worry is you might say, hey, look, even if these things are necessary for a meaningful life, even if you do need this subjective feeling, even if you do need projects of worth, you might want to suggest that this is not enough, not sufficient for living a meaningful life. This is what I'm going to call the cosmic insignificance objection. And Susan Wolf does talk about this. And the objection says that being actively engaged in projects of worth is not enough, is not sufficient for having meaning in our life since our lives might still be cosmically insignificant, and we might still be worried about this kind of cosmic insignificance. So remember those existential experiences that people might have on their deathbed or when they contemplate their death or maybe in a midlife crisis. Well, when people have these experiences and they're worrying about the meaning of their lives, they're often caused by this thought, this idea that our lives are just a speck, a tiny little part of a very big universe that's going to go on for all time. Like billions of years from now, human beings will be gone. And 
what I do in my life now is not going to change what the universe is going to be like a billion years from now. So in this way, I worry that I'm just like this small speck in the vast cosmos and that what I do, my life, doesn't make any lasting or permanent or enduring difference to the cosmos. So pointing out that we can still feel passionate about the kind of worthwhile activities that Wolf has in mind, like moral and intellectual accomplishments, aesthetic creation or appreciation, maybe religious activities, pointing out that you can engage with those kind of activities doesn't seem to satisfy the worries people are having when they imagine themselves as this little speck in the cosmos. So the worry is that we're looking for more than what Susan Wolf has to offer when we're searching for meaning. So Wolf responds to two different versions of this worry. The first version of this worry is embedded in a kind of theistic worldview, one that appeals to ideas about God. So some people worry that nothing is going to have objective value unless God exists. And the claim is that all projects, everything we do is equally worthless if there is no God. They don't have any value. So on this kind of meaning, our longing for meaning would only be satisfied if we were convinced that God exists. So you need more than just to be convinced that you're engaged with the kinds of projects Susan Wolf has in mind. Now, version number two says that in order for our projects to be worthwhile, our lives would have to have some enduring outcome, some permanent outcome. But nothing we do has any enduring outcome in the grand scheme of the universe, and all our projects are thereby equally worthless. On this view, spending your time with friends and family is just as worthless as collecting rubber bands for your whole life because neither of them makes any difference to what the universe is going to be like in the grand scheme of things. Thus, meaning can't come from engaging with these kinds of projects of worth that Susan Wolf is suggesting. Now, the second version of the objection has been used to motivate either a subjective account of meaning. So the idea is, since nothing is enduring, we can't get meaning from engaging in these worthwhile projects since nothing endures anyway. So we must be getting meaning from something else. Maybe it's just from our, like what we decide is meaningful to us instead. Alternatively, sometimes this kind of objection has been used to motivate a nihilist view that comes to the idea that, unfortunately, just there is no meaning. Like There is no meaning in people's lives, and that sucks. Now, Wolf does have a reply to both versions of this kind of objection. So with respect to the theistic one that appeals to God, she argues that that idea is actually consistent with her hybrid account of meaning. Because Wolf doesn't offer any view about what makes projects worthwhile. She's actually very hesitant because she takes to heart. She doesn't want to appear elitist at all in her position. She doesn't want to judge some activities as being more worthwhile than others. And she thinks we can make mistakes and it's not clear to anybody, to her or anybody else, which activities really are worthwhile and which ones aren't. This theistic idea is just adding a theory about where objective value would come from. It says what makes some activities worthwhile is that God has given them objective value, has maybe made them part of the plan for our lives. And other activities God has not given that kind of objective value to. So this theory can agree that active engagement with projects of worth is what gives meaning. They're just saying, and what makes projects worthwhile is God. Susan Wolf herself doesn't seem to be sympathetic to the idea that what makes projects worthwhile is a decision by God. But she's just pointing out that such a view is still consistent with what she says about meaning since she hasn't given a theory about objective value. Now, her response to version number two about this worry that nothing we do endures, she says, this seems to be focused on a kind of irrational concern for permanence or enduring outcomes. But something seems to be able to have value even if it doesn't last forever. Someone who cures cancer seems to do something valuable even if people eventually go extinct. Why does it have to last forever in order for it to be a good thing, to be a valuable thing? If you feed a hungry person, it looks like you've done a good thing, even if you can't feed them for the rest of their life. The fact that it's not permanent or enduring 
doesn't mean that it didn't have value during the time it was happening. So that's all for this video. I'll see y'all next time. Bye-bye.